And welcome to Shift F1, a podcast about speed race cars. That, by the way, is Quebecois for to have a fire in one's butt. Oh, interesting. Yes. Feu, sure. Was au revoir at the start? Goodbye? Au revoir. Oh, au revoir. Av- okay. okay. Av- A-V-O-I-R. French is mysterious to me. Uh, but it apparently yes. is an expression meaning to be angry in Quebecois. Very good. There was... Plenty of French-speaking anger in qualifying, but we will get to that in a minute. I'm Drew Scanlon. Joining me, Danny O'Dwyer. How are you, Danny? Sacre bleu. Those Ferraris just love parking on that last turn. What's that all about? Um, Yeah, this was a fun race weekend. We don't often say that. Sometimes you say it was a fun race. But honestly, practice and qualifying might have been the best part of this weekend. And I'm not saying that because the race was boring. It just was... It was... uh, It was... The whole thing was it was a good time. I super enjoyed this entire weekend of racing. Indeed. Also joining us, Rob Zachney. How are you, Rob? Yeah, same. I also enjoyed the weekend. It was a uh, we we were sort of blessed by the weather gods uh, yes. in, in qualifying, and it, I think it set us up for a more interesting race than we might have otherwise had. Well, if you are new to this podcast, a very warm welcome to you. And if you are new to Formula One itself, we recommend listening to our preseason primer episode, which assumes no prior F1 knowledge and explains how the sport works and who everybody is. So if you'd like to go back and listen to that, it's episode 216. Uh, then you can come back and join us for this uh, very exciting Canadian Grand Prix episode. Uh, also, the show is supported entirely by our audience over at patreon.com slash shift F1, where every month we release bonus podcasts and videos exclusively for our patrons that cover <coughs> that cover racing documentaries and films f1 video games <laughs> oh boy i'm just getting Whoa. choked up with all these offerings uh <laughs> experiments with other racing series and a lot of weird things so if you would like to support the show and get access to all that fun stuff head over to patreon.com slash shift f1 or click the link in the show notes what do we have going on this month denny i had to mute my mic because you'd like you'd given me your contagious just enthusiasm for <laughs> for patronage for um, content yeah we're for content yeah um i still haven't had time to edit my little video um and we still haven't uh, figured out what we're doing for the podcast and i think that's because all three of us are insanely busy right now with our regular yeah. day jobs speaking of raining and pouring <laughs> exactly yeah yeah so um uh, yes uh trust us we will have an interesting fun patron exclusive podcast as we always do uh this month and uh, i'm gonna edit that video next week once i've gotten some of this work um, behind me um but yes massive thanks to all of our patrons including our incredible title sponsors cyphers training turf scs alex medina kick a hat of the art at team blackjack michael maves gordy's army talking autos olivia evans ironstation.dev telemetrydeck.com ftc drew stewart bailey foot abdullah althani a meme a documentarian a journalist on the same podcast still abraham getchell ch mod plus x bunny crimes snigs alex Goucher, max Voltar, circuit demon troy stammer umberto roca william rumpf irvine clinical research lachlan the madden man and jason kelly amazing thank you everyone for supporting us thank you um we, you're supporting this uh what probably is going to be a large meaty podcast because yes. as you said danny uh, practice, qualifying, and the race all had stuff to talk about. So let's just jump in with free practice one, which yeah. lasted all of five minutes. <laughs> this was very strange. Yeah, it stopped because of a crash, but that's not why it stopped for good. Um, uh, the Was it Oka? I forget who actually crashed there. And I'm thinking about it. So much happened between uh, the start of uh, the, the weekend and the end. Was it Ocon or Gasly? I, I, I forget. Somebody had an off. Um, there was a red flag called, and then everyone I think waited. It was Ocon. Was it Ocon? Yeah. Um, and it was either a crash or a problem. Yeah. And then yeah, he stopped on the track, so that's why they red flagged it. Um, and uh, they had to uh, cart him off. It was in just at the start of sector two, and then everyone waited and waited and waited for uh, practice to start back, and it didn't because they had a problem with the on-site uh, CCTV system, which is what they use to basically monitor accidents on the circuit. So they couldn't get a couple of the cameras hooked up or something um, and try as they may to resolve it, they couldn't and they just simply can't have cars racing if they can't see certain parts of the track for obvious safety reasons. Um, so after a little while, they decided uh, to not go ahead 
with Free Practice 1. So instead, what they did was they extended Free Practice 2, which is great because, and we kind of talked about this a while ago when they were talking about, I forget who it was, there was some uh, idea posited that perhaps we would go down to like a one or two practice situation to really, you know, force everyone into um, racing a bit faster. I guess it happened with the sprint race weekends. That's mm-hmm. kind of a byproduct of that whole uh, situation. Uh, but it ended up being really interesting because we had loads of cars on track. And then because we had changeable weather, which seemed to be just a sort of a recurring uh, issue throughout the weekend, uh, we also had a lot of cars running out on inters, we cars uh, having a lot of fun in the West near the end of the session as well. It was, uh, it was a, a wild one. Yeah, free practice three, very wet. Sign spun, hit yes. the wall. Um, Big crash. And then, you know what? It might a- have actually been ghastly in free practice one because th- there was this weird quirk of the rules that Ocon had mentioned after practice saying that, um, well, this actually from race fans explains it pretty well. Having not run at all in the opening session, which was red flagged after four minutes and never restarted, um, Ocon hit trouble in the extended second practice later on Friday coming to a halt 17 laps in due to a loss of water pressure. That's what I was thinking of. Um, and his plight was made worse by the arrival of rain at the end of that session. The majority of his rivals took the opportunity to run on a set of intermediate tires, as you yes. said, Danny, um, which Ocon was unable to do because his car wasn't working. And under F1's rules, each driver, and I didn't know this, receives four sets of intermediate tires for a race weekend. And an extra set is made available to any driver who uses intermediates in first or second practice. Yes, it was amazing. If either so- of those sessions are declared wet. So second practice was declared wet. Ocon, because of uh, not getting out in fruit practice one and it being effectively canceled, and then him having the problem before the rain <laughs> came, meant that he didn't run inners for practice one and two. So that means um, everybody else gets to claim another set of intermediate tires for qualifying, which, as it turns out, proved pretty useful. Yeah, so that, it was very funny. So when it happened at the end of uh, free practice two, the when the rain started, it was kind of mostly in the hairpin area, you know, that like right at the end of sector two before they hit the back straight. And basically, even the commentators knew like, oh, what they're, they're all going to go out on inches now because they want to see if they, they can get that extra set. They get the extra set, but apparently also um, the inters, when they go on fresh, have a sort of a, I forget what they refer to it as, but either some sort of, uh, coating or there's like bits of debris or whatever that are part of it that basically having like a scrub set of inters like one or two laps ridden on them in the wet is actually preferable to have anyway so they were all getting an extra set but they were also getting the benefit of having this one set be um, scrubbed in a little bit and um, it was also very funny because that by the time the last cars were going out on track including I think the biggest problem uh drivers had was i think it was signs and Bottas was that it was pure like red flag conditions at that chicane by the time free practice two is ending but like they're not going out on wets to get an extra set of wets like that's not a <laughs> right. rule so they were all going out on oh, inters even oh, that, though yeah so they were the, so the footage of the uh, Bottas almost crashed into somebody because he just completely aquaplaned on the inters out onto the grass there's a footage. There's footage of signs, and like it looks like there's two inches of water where he is. Like it's. It looks it was, like it's ankle deep. It's it was, so much water. It was crazy, and there was none there like five minutes early. So it was funny because they all went out on inters. Arguably, they shouldn't have been on the tracks at all. Like they were saying, like, "Oh, this could be wet conditions," and it got to the point where they're like, "No, they, they wouldn't." Like the only reason they were out on the track is because practice had ended and they were coming around to the end of it, and they had to drive back anyway. So. Right. Yeah, it was it was pretty crazy, and it was it ended up being that wet as well in the the following morning, and that's um, part of the reason I think why Signs binned it. But his crash was bad; he he ruined the front and rear of the car. Um, uh, he kind of snapped the wall and flinged back. Not not uh, before he irritated Albon though for breaking at the end of the start finish straight or at the end of the the back straight Twice. before the chicane. Yeah. Twice, right? Yeah, it got called out, and obviously it comes up again in qualifying. Yeah. Uh, Well, weird weather, as it often does, contributed to making qualifying pretty exciting. Um, In Q1, as time ticked down, we saw a lot of cars bunching up, as you mentioned, Danny, at that penultimate corner to, and they do this to get enough space between cars to do their final runs. Um, But of course, because time is now, you know, ticking down, there are other cars on the track 
uh, like Gasly, who are finishing their laps. And so Gasly basically had to ab- abort to avoid a collision with signs, um, you know, giving up a lap that, according to the team, would have easily put him through to Q2. So a lot of block or impeding penalties happened here with signs, Sunoda, and Stroll, who all earned uh, three place penalties uh, for impeding. Gasly, probably the angriest I have ever seen him. Yeah, absolutely livid. The whole of qualifying was super tense, all of the sec- um, uh, parts of qualifying, because the changeable conditions meant that oftentimes it all went down to that final lap again, or getting on the right set of tires, and it yeah. Q2 threw off was, a lot of people. Yeah, it, it was. that's, where, uh, that's what uh, happened in Q2, um, because you had this damp track to begin with, which then dried, and then it rained. So the question was, when do you go on to dry tires, a.k.a. slicks? If you do it too late, you might not have time to set a lap before the rain comes. But if you do it too early and don't you know, set a first lap on those intermediate tires, then the rain might then come when you're on slicks, and then you'll have to pit again for intermediate tires and you might not set a time at all. Um, and and the, ti- so, the times between slicks and wet tires is seconds, like... If you're it's new to F1, yeah. it is like outrageously different. So even if you have to tiptoe, like if there if there's one part of it that's really really wet, right. it still behooves you to to get on slick tires. And then the issue that happens in Q3 is that by this stage, and it has to also be mentioned that the track is like suboptimal for a Saturday anyway because it's been raining, and there's not many support races in Canada either. So it's actually by the time they like came in for qualifying, it had rained at the end of uh, practice. The, the track was basically fresh like a Thursday morning again. So yeah. it was it was especially unhelpful. And then the issue you have in Q3 is because it starts to dry up. If it stops raining and they're driving around, then they're creating this really dry patch that they're sitting on that they, you can maybe go to softs on, you know, if, if, you, if you stay within that. But then again, it starts raining. So yeah. that's even worse because it's not even a question between inters and wets. It's a question between softs and wets. And you're like, what? What do you right. do? So just to go back to Q2 for a second, Stroll loses it on, on intermediates and spins down this narrow section of track. Somehow it doesn't hit anything. It's crazy. His um, nose does hit the wall, but he hits it flush, so nothing right. breaks. It's just kind of a glance. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, yeah. As the track dried, Albon was the first to go on to slicks. Um, and anyone else who was on intermediates could not touch him. Despite, you know, that he, the fact that he's in a Williams, um, there is time for some teams to switch on to slicks to follow Albon, but Ferrari crucially had not set a lap time. And so they stay out on intermediate tires, uh, just to bank something. Um, Perez tried slicks, but went back to intermediates as it started to rain. Yeah. Um, but those three got caught out having not set a a time on slick tires. Well, the window was really narrow. Like, th- yeah. this is the thing that Albin, <clears throat> you know, in some ways it seemed like kind of a straightforward call because of, like, the incentives for going out on slicks. But to the point about, like, light rain, but, like, inters appropriate versus, like, much heavier rain where the inters are starting to struggle, you don't want to be in that situation either. The The band on what the inters can turn depends quite a bit on how wet the track is. And so Albin uh, and, and William has made a very decisive call, like, we are going to start this session on the on the slicks and i do wonder like if 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 stroll uh he didn't really he didn't really delay things though with the with the spin uh it, it was just like the the weather conditions were it, it was that tight a window where there's like one shot mm-hmm. near the start to get out on slicks and set a time and everyone who yeah they wanted that banker lap and everyone who thought, but then we'll we'll go and run slicks, got burned by the fact the weather started to turn again, and with <laughs> yeah. the time wasted in the pits and the outlap, uh, it completely implodes. And you know who was not happy about that? Leclerc, uh, Charles Leclerc, mm. uh, lost it over the radio uh, at at his team, which I feel like we're saying now every week is just <laughs> one or both the Ferrari drivers is just taking a little moment to berate their team over over the radio. But again, uh, here's here is Leclerc's story. 
I mean, I called for slicks on the outlap. It was clearly for slicks. I think Alex did that and went earlier than everybody else on the slicks, and that was clearly the right choice. There was no risk taken whatsoever. For some reason, the team decided otherwise. That's it. I just think we were making our life way too difficult in those situations. I had a clear opinion, and yeah, we decided to do something else. So I am frustrated. It's again, I you know, nothing new to what I talked about a couple weeks ago. It feels so broken over at Ferrari that on the one hand, the drivers are a bit out of pocket every week. And at the same time, I would be burning the garage down with some of the miscues that are coming out of it. I think it's one thing like to get the strategy wrong, but to be the driver and say, we should be on slicks Mm. and them to be like, no. And this is how it goes, man. Yeah. Yeah, And I, 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 sorry, go on. I just, I can't help but think like, we see this a lot from Ferrari. Not that I, I, I understand why they wanted to stay out on intermediates, right? Like you want to, you want to bank a lap. Most otherwise, teams did. Yes. Right. You want to bank a lap um, because otherwise you might get shut out completely and not have a, a lap time at all. And that would be very embarrassing. Um, but I can't help thinking that every time there is a decision to be made at Ferrari, they always go with the, more conservative one like listen let's just get a we don't want to take any risks here and go on to slicks because that might not work in our favor well, well but if it pays off then you it, it would be fine uh and i can't help I man rob let me know if this is an appropriate um uh comparison here is just ferrari just love the prevent defense you know there's a bit of that but the weird thing is if it were just they're they're too conservative I think that's one thing. The weird thing about Ferrari is if you if you if you include the Bonato era in this discussion, they do seem like they zig when they should zag and vice versa. And that's the, like you know, the inter, the the call they made at Interlagos last year was not a conservative decision. It was a weird decision. They try mm. weird like they'll never see this coming. This will be a Hail Mary strategy to to put us back into it. We're going to get to this the race. I think they make another weird decision during the race with with, with strategy. And so it, it's this it's this bizarre thing where in some ways they're very conservative, but then also um you know what it is? I think they're very conservative in a lot of places, but the minute they begin to feel like they're behind where they should be. They are like the gambler's fallacy team where they start like looking for bigger wagers with, with higher payoffs, but are worse odds. And they just start like pulling that. Well, so that's an interesting thing. Cause to me this weekend, it was like a tale of two Ferraris. Cause I think their race strategy was fantastic. Like they, they, they made the right calls, but it does speak to a little bit, you know, it's weird, right? Cause I, I feel like there's some sort of like a, I don't know what the term is for this, but like, Sometimes we're looking for fire with Ferrari or like when they make mistakes, we notice it because Completely. it's like a pattern, right? I think like Claire shouting over the radio, if that doesn't happen, maybe that decision falls into the background a bit more. Um, It's hard to tell, but it is funny how when they have something to lose, they're too conservative in qualifying and they mess it up. And then as Rob said, during the race, when arguably they're a little bit out of position, especially with the science penalty that comes, um. They go for a gutsy call uh, against the rest of the field, and it pays off, and they 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 do quite well out of it. But and Williams is a team that that needs to make those risks. Totally. Right? it looks in hindsight like a brilliant call, but at they the moment it was like, lose. oh yeah, Williams got nothing to lose. He's going to go on to slicks, and if it yeah. didn't work out for him, we would just go like, oh well, yeah, Williams yeah. had to try, right? So there's totally. definitely like a double standard here, and it's definitely like the narrative is Ferrari is bad at strategy these days, and so anytime there is a, uh, you're right, Danny. A story that, or a you know, anything that plays into that, we jump on it. Um, I think though, if they make more calls like they did in the race, we might see that wane a little bit. So yeah, it, maybe it, let's. It, yeah, it was. It's a mess. It, this was a messy weekend for Ferrari fans because you had that happening. You also had signs binning the car. You also had signs getting a silly penalty for doing this stopping in the middle of the track thing habitually during the, <laughs> the before the race. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a, a rough up and down roller coaster for everyone, but definitely for Ferrari fans. Uh, and for and for one more here, as I'll uh, close out qualifying with Q three here, everybody but Albon manages to set a lap in that first phase because the the it's coming down now. So again, you need to set a, a lap ASAP. Um, things are effectively ended though when Piastri crashes and brings out a red flag. So red flag comes out, even more water gets dumped on the track. It basically calls it right there, right. In the seconds between P- seeing Piastri in the wall and the red flag coming out, Nico Hulkenberg crosses the line and goes second fastest. 
and then the red flag waves and Alonzo crosses the line. <laughs> and it yes. doesn't count. Yes. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately for Hulkenberg, though, oh, it was not to last uh, the front row start. I know the guy cannot catch a break. Um, he was penalized three places for a red flag infringement speeding under the red flag. Uh, race fans has a quote from the stewards. It says the driver had just finished his fastest lap and then started another push lap. He was at turn one when the red flag was displayed. However, at that point, he was already one and a half seconds over his delta time. So they, me- they measure how fast you're going, not by the speedometer, but by how fast you're going through sectors. Um, so he's saying, or this says that he's a second and a half over his delta time, meaning he is uh, to, uh, wait, I don't, to, he's one and a half seconds slower <laughs> than he needs to be. He claimed this made it extremely difficult for him to come below the delta in the next sector. Um, so, he was confused about this. There's uh, some radio here, some radio messages that I can read, um, also cataloged on racefans.net. Uh, uh, he's in a similar confusion uh, as I am. Um, he's also getting like beeping in his ears because I think that that happens um, uh, to, to let, let you know if you're under or over the, the delta time. He says, it's the beeping guys is driving me nuts here. Am I to be negative or positive? His engineer says, you should be positive now, plus you need to slow down. Slow down, and it's also double yellow here. Watch for Piastri here. This is where Piastri crashed. No, I think I'm going too slow, says Hulkenberg. We need to go faster. I don't know, you tell me. His engineer says, okay, I'll go check with Mike to get out of this mode. Press in. Is it too fast or too slow? Tell me. It's too fast, too fast, because it's a red flag. So a lot of like... (laughs) This makes me feel so good about getting confused every time VSC comes out in the F1 video games. <laughs> and I constantly am like, wait, what's it telling me to do here? It's like, sp- speed up, no slow down. And I'm like, what? The, like, yeah, because it does. It's sort of it's dynamic. And so it's it's like there's this weird latency between you trying to react to what it's telling you <laughs> and then your delta changing and the prompt changes. And you're like, am I doing the right thing or the wrong thing? And it's real It's real nice to like hear a driver and engineer whose job this is be like, yeah. uh, we got our top men working on what the beeping means. Yeah. Uh, and the stewards actually threw him a bone. Like the penalty for this is usually 10 places. Oh, my God. Um, and so they were like, they actually say he, the driver, admitted to confusion about the beep signal in his headset, and therefore at one stage thought he was going too slow, and that's what caused him to speed up. And so they they took that into mitigation and uh, gave him a three-place penalty instead. So uh, he qualified second. He'll start fifth. Ahead of him, Max Verstappen in first. Fernando Alonso second. Lewis Hamilton third. George Russell fourth. Then Nico Hulkenberg in fifth, followed by Esteban Ocon, Lando Norris, Oscar Piastri, Alex Albon, and Charles Leclerc. Um... In 10th. Then we've got Carlos Sainz. Uh, He also got three-place penalty for impeding. Uh, Sergio Perez, now, according to race fans, he has failed to reach Q3 in half of the races this year. Mm. Uh, Kevin Magnussen will start 13th. Valtteri Bottas, 14th. Pierre Gasly, 15th, with that uh, negation of his hot lap after the impeding by Sainz, who will start ahead of him. Uh, Lance Stroll in 16th also uh, got three place penalty for impeding Ocon uh, although I saw a quote from Ocon saying like yeah he shouldn't have been in, uh, penalized for that oh, really? he actually there's an on, in the onboard video you can see Stroll he's not like on a slow lap in the racing line he's actually like <laughs> squirreling around trying to navigate the chicane and having a hard time oh funny and uh, Science also didn't get a penalty for being almost stationary on the back straight later it was in Q3 so mm. he, his solution to slowing down before the chicane was to slow down like 200 feet before the chicane, which just creates a really scary sign of a car driving on the left side of that road at like full tilt. And then a parked Ferrari just going, Zoom, that's like in the middle of the track. But apparently yeah. he did nothing wrong then. So huh. I don't know. Uh, 17th, Nick DeVries. 18th, Logan Sargent. Uh, 19th, Yuki Tsunoda. Also three places for impeding. And 20th, Zhou Guan Yu. Boy, you would you think with the with all those penalties, the teams would figure out how not to impede other drivers. But God, I don't know. Yeah, it's becoming a bit of a problem this year. Um. Well, let's get to the race. Do we want to start with Rob the 
new broadcasting experiment that Formula One was trying. Oh, I forgot it. I cannot believe I forgot to watch this. Did you guys watch? I watched. I watched, the, I watched as much as I could take. Oh no! So I, for science, watched the entire race like this. Oh wow! Okay. Okay. But Rob, please give me your impressions. Drew, my impressions were not positive. No. Like it. So it was one of those things. Let's, sorry, where, let's reset here. So oh, yes. there, the on in America. Uh, and I think on the in the UK as well. Oh yeah, they were um, they were pitching it for Sky audiences for sure. They were. Uh, so on uh, here in America, it, on ABC was the normal Sky broadcast with David Croft and, and Martin Brundle. Uh, on ESPN two, The Deuce, <laughs> uh, Will Arnett and Daniel Ricardo, the Grandstand, in there. Yes, in this this program called the Grandstand, were quote unquote commentating the race. Rob. Yeah. So this is one of those moments where it can be very easy, especially if you like are knowledgeable about sports that, you know, every, everyone, you, you hit a certain point where you feel you've outgrown the play by play uh, commentators and the, and the color commentator. And you're, you're just sitting there being like, this person needs to shut the hell up. This person sucks. These guys are clowns. Mm -hmm. They don't know what they're talking about. Your galaxy I can do brain. better than this. Yeah. And maybe, maybe in some ways you could, maybe in a vacuum, you would also have like better thoughts or as you hear them talking, your reactions, it's like, no, they got that, they didn't get that quite right. But here's the difference. It is very hard to keep up a steady patter with a live event. There's a reason like sports casting, less common, less color com com commentary, but like sports casting is like a real skill that requires a lot of practice and like training and not everyone can do it. And certainly if you are, you know, just a, just a fan of you, even people like who do a job like we do, where we talk into mics a lot. It's still a different thing than trying to keep up with a live event that is unfolding in front of you. And I guess also there is an element of self-consciousness that kicks in when you were doing that live in front of tons of people. And boy, did it feel like I was watching a worst case scenario as oh, no. a performer unfold. Yes. Oh, no. um, so there's a lot of things going on here. Daniel Ricardo obviously very knowledgeable about formula one being the current, you know, uh, test and reserve driver for Red Bull. Um, and with all of his experience, he was trying to provide that Martin Brundle kind of insight, but because Will Arnett is not a professional, he didn't know how to, uh, throw to Ricardo or receive tosses from him. This was made more difficult because, uh, Daniel was in Canada at the race and Will Arnett was in Brooklyn in a You're studio. Kidding. So the lag is awful. Yes. We do oh, a podcast. No. We know all about that. It can be rough. Um, they thankfully had a third guy that they could throw to. I believe his name is Sean Kelly. Sean Kelly. Uh, yeah. The, the, the stats guy. Yeah. He, yeah. He, so he does stats for Formula One. Um, and he, every time he would pop in, it would be like, you know, manna from heaven. Like, oh, finally a guy <laughs> that can, uh, who, who seems to, to, to have done this before. Um, and actually some of, so the, the format of the show is it, it actually didn't even seem like they Formats were trying to commentate a lot of work the race. There, Drew. Yes. <laughs> the race started and this was maybe the weirdest part. They were completely silent. Like we're all used to, you know, David Croft losing his mind, Alex Jakes, you know, uh, narrating what is happening. They're always like, okay, let's watch the start here. It was, it was, it was weird. Oh my. Um, it was like watching like Danny. It's like, Imagine the worst Super Bowl party you've ever attended. Like people just who don't get on, who don't know each other very well, <laughs> just like silently watching a game and then occasionally trying to like uh I thought that was a that was a good play. That was a hell of a throw there, huh? <laughs> and to see just see it's something to talk about. The entire commentary felt like that. Also, Will Arnett's voice seemed shot to hell. He has a very like distinctive like uh like rumbly baso voice that's gotten mm. more rumbly as he's as he's gotten older but like this is why he's on a bunch of commercials as a, as a voiceover guy but he sounded rough uh to the point that maybe wonder like is he under the weather but also like daniel ricardo when have we ever seen evidence that he actually has the gift of gab as it were uh mm. you know he's 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 a goofball but I'm not sure I would ever say he's like, oh, he's a really like garrulous and interesting guy in that way. So he's also trying to figure out like, what can I say here to 
to offer things. And, like occasionally there were questions about like the experience of being a developing driver, for instance, like that thing was like a life preserver for him where it's like, I can talk about this. I can talk about mm, the yeah. experience of like growing up in motorsport, but he, like, yes, there was no good interplay between him and Arnett. And the other thing is, I swear to God, in like within five minutes, they both knew this was not going well. And oh, so the no. self consciousness oh, kicked no. in. <laughs> and you were you were just praying for like somebody to come in and rescue them. And I, you know, yeah. this, like uh, Sean Kelly could do that occasionally when he was checking back in and just dropping little serving up like things to say about the race. But I, to me, it also looked like within five minutes we were dealing with the kind of stage fright that kicks in when you are doing a bad event. And they also tried to make it a talk show. So they brought in three different guests at different times. Patrick Dempsey, uh, Marshawn Lynch, oh, cool. and Josh Allen. Um, okay. Patrick Dempsey was actually maybe the best. Like he's a driver. He's a, race, a serious race. He's a race driver. Well, yeah. yeah. And he's, you know, a, a very, you know, Will Arnett's an actor too, but like he just, he just has like the stage presence and right. the ability to like, uh, you know, narrate and, you know, offer things up and like t take the temperature and the tempo of what's going on. Um, that was so, beast mode. Yeah. Uh, he, that was, that was pretty awkward. Okay. Um, <laughs> they talked a lot about peeing in the car uh, and how Lynch is disgusted by the shoey. They were, cool. I think they were trying to make there. it, you know, funnier than it was. It was, it was tough. Josh Allen was at the PGA tour and had like, you know, a three G cell phone connection. It oh, was no. awful. Oh, it just like so cringeworthy M multiple times. The two commentators were eating food. What? Yeah. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> we can't. What is this? No, it was just like you're hanging separate. out with your mates. That's exactly what it. Yeah, but it sounds like what it, it tried like a, to be. But like a zero bants zone. Like the bants were bad. The bants got zero left chemistry. overnight in the sun, and they're just they're spoiled now. It's a it's a bad vibe zone. This I look, this format I think is overrated to begin with. I think the Manning <laughs> cast works because like they are brothers. They know yeah. each other really well. They're weird guys who are kind of just kind of interesting to watch. And they know the sport really, really well, and they're both pretty well media trained. Other attempts to do the, to channel the Manning cast magic, such as it is, I don't think have gone well. But this was probably the worst. This wow. was the, like this was excruciating to watch. Like if it were cringe comedy, it's a masterpiece. <laughs> Will we see it again? I wonder. When's the next one? It's a, it's Austin, I think. Yeah, I think they're doing all of the uh, North, North American ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. Yep. So I don't know from like a broadcast curiosity perspective, uh, I thought it was fascinating, but it was very difficult to watch. I don't think yeah, I will probably. watch it again. Now, well, now I have to watch you it. Watch. Well, yeah, yeah, all right, yeah, you yeah, watch yeah. the second one, Dan. Let us know how it goes. <laughs> well, probably this is this is the sort of thing that you could imagine improving very very quickly because a lot of things will be learned, and also if they realize like, oh, it just needs one more host on it who will like spark something then it works but yeah it was it was grim yeah i think you 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 let sean kelly talk or they i think they do they did have a producer in their ears because they he would like say like oh apparently this happened um and maybe it was kelly um but i think they need to dial that up right mm -hmm. uh and they also need to get the i'm sure there is like when you go to um sports commentary school there is some um, you know, uh, system that you work out between you, you and your commentator to be like, I'm throwing to you, even though there's lag, just keep going and then throw it back to me. This is why they say over on the radio, right? Like they, um, you know, Brundle and Croft have like figured that out. Like it's a, you know, well, I feel uh, like all three of us say th you know, like, anything I, anymore. I say it as I'm cutting over you, but I think like all, <laughs> all three of us are used to the, at least some of that from being on like, giant bomb couchers or podcasts or whatever like it is a very like it's a skill it's a skill yeah yeah it takes a while it's and sometimes it works with one person and not with another you know what i mean like yeah. you and both sides of that um equation need to be there so that's a shame i'm not going to watch this one in case i spoil myself on this one but i will take the bullet next time around okay okay uh well let's get to the race such as <laughs> such as it was as we watched it uh danny you want to take us through the start Sure. 35 minutes into this podcast, we're finally talking about the race. Oh, okay. good. Um, uh, probably just as well that not really much happens at the start. Uh, Verstappen gets a good start. 
Uh, Lewis Hamilton gets a great start in third, and this is one of those tracks that if you get a good start in third place behind the leader, you are a happy boy because it is not much of a run-up to the first turn. The track weaves to the right and then sharply cuts to the left. So as long as you have a nose ahead of whoever's in second, you are laughing. And Alonso didn't have a fantastic start and Lewis Hamilton had him dead to rights on the uh, apex of turn one. Um, aside from that, I'm not sure if there was much uh, movement around the back. There was the the signs and Perez kind of scuffle. Um, signs went for a pass on Perez, but took that curb heavily and Perez regained the place. And then as they're coming down, on the back straight into the chicane, Signs makes a move around the outside of Perez to take 11th place. Uh, but that means that Magnuson has to go onto the grass to avoid Signs and uh, cuts that last corner. Uh, that was that was a dicey moment. What what happened to Yuki in all of this? Because he was down 30 seconds, felt like with a pit stop, like immediately. But I never saw the incident where he lost all that time. He came in for uh, hards immediately, but I'm like. What triggered that? I don't. I don't know. I'm trying to remember. I can't remember. It's a weird thing. It was like it was a notable thing because on the timing and scoring, you could see that he was just like in no man's land, and we just never saw a replay of what had happened. Again, the, the F1 broadcast like rations replays of like state of play stuff, uh, like they are precious manna from heaven. <laughs> yeah. Um, lap seven, Sergeant is told to stop the car by a marshal post. Uh, around that time is when Piastri gets around Hulkenberg uh, on the inside of turn one, actually, for, for sixth place. Um, and then lap, lap 12, we cut to Russell going slowly yeah. with tire parts wheeling down the road, um, having just hit the wall at turn nine after t- himself taking too much curb, bringing out the safety car. Uh, Russell limps back to the pits for a tire and front wing change and does come back out, but it's great timing for the leaders who all come in, Hamilton, um, is released ahead of Alonzo, who Just... appears to take some evasive action, this... but Toto Wolf not <laughs> convinced. This was a, uh, this was some Alonzo. In, in if this was soccer, you'd call it a flop. If it was football, <laughs> yeah. you'd call it a dive. Alonzo was was moving his arms around like he was uh, he was he was trying to stop himself from going into a wall. But I think it was a bit. Let's call it simulation. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so go ahead, Rob. Like, this is the moment the Ferrari make their key decision. Yes. And I know you all were like, Ferrari got the strategy just right. They nailed it. At the and time. And my question is, like, did they get their strategy right? Or did they luck into the fact that nobody knew how bad the hards were going to be? It's, yes. I, it's hard to tell because I, cause there wasn't any hard running in the previous, like, during... Was there maybe there must have been in P two there must have been some but I don't know if they got them that far but but you're right because at the time I was thinking why are Ferrari not doing what everyone else is doing like this seems like a it's not the perfect window for a first swap but like it seems like maybe more of a risk to not do it they did there was a quote after the fact and again this could be like revisionist history but they they did say <laughs> that uh, their car was performing really well. Um, in practice on the medium tire mm. um, and poorly on the hard. Um, th- that may be like also historical knowledge about like the, whatever C compound they were using. Um, but at least to hear, hear them say it, there was some thinking uh, behind that. Uh, uh, yeah. To me, it's just like everyone made the same decision to get off the medium, go onto the hard and see how far they could push it. Ferrari did not. And what proves to be the case over the course of the race is the hard sucked. The hard, the hard yeah. was not particularly durable, and it was slow. And the medium wore in beautifully and held up under race pace like all day long. And so, like, if they truly had like gotten just enough data where they had an instinct that the medium was the way to go, like hats off to them. But to me, it feels a little bit like just what are the odds that this team, looking at the data that every that so many other people had, were like. It's gonna be it's gonna be the medium. This is the way it's gonna go. To me, this felt like they were doing kind of a long shot strategy and it paid off for them because everyone as often is the case, uh, sometimes the hard is not the durable tire because it performs so badly that it, you're just not going to get the distance out of it. 
Paris also does not come in, um, also choosing to do a, a one-stop. Uh, and this safety car is also where Norris earns a five-second penalty for unsportsmanlike behavior, which even Daniel Ricardo on my broadcast was like, I've never even seen that before. Um, race fans has quotes from the stewards and from uh, team principal of McLaren, Andreas Seidel. Uh, quote, during the safety car period, the driver, uh, Norris, slowed to allow a gap to form between his teammate in car 81, Piastri, and him. In doing so, he delayed the cars behind. So he was doing this, Norris was, to create enough gaps when they both pitted that they wouldn't stack up and lose time to the cars behind. Uh, there was a significant, this is the stewards still, there was a significant difference in speed between Norris and uh, Piastri between turns uh, thir- 10 and 13, approximately 50 kilometers an hour. Article 12.2.1.I of the International Sporting Code refers to any infringement of the principles of fairness and competition behavior in an unsportsmanlike manner or attempt to influence the results of a competition in a way that is contrary to sporting ethics. That's why it is unsportsmanlike. Because we don't have another rule for it, so we'll just, it's like the catch-all bucket at the end of the rule list. Yes. I wonder, Um, like, have they, because sometimes they do kind of caution people again, like, at various points, there's always a tug of war between how people drive under safety car, between people trying to game it a little bit, and there's like the it's acceptable gaming of it, and then there's points where periodically, uh, the stewards they have sort of we clarify and it's like you can't you can't stretch the field out that way you can't you can't like str- string it out. I'm curious uh, mm-hmm. if there's something like that happening in the background, but it did seem kind of universally the drivers were a bit uh, puzzled by the entire thing. It did give us Ted Kravitz acting as if uh, the FIA had <laughs> executed him down in pit lane, yeah. uh, where he we just got a five minute soliloquy of how can you say Lando Norris, the best boy, the most could likable ever driver, be unsporting? He's like yeah. a little puppy. Mm. And I was at that point, I was like, I'm ready to get off Sky. I'm ready to start watching the official <laughs> F1 broadcast. Act, like, actually, is there any broadcast with no Back English on it? Because I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, Norris also, once we get going again, um, dives up the inside of his teammate. <laughs> so much for slowing down. Uh, at the hairpin to take 10th place. Really a great move. Um, around lap 20 is when we get some action from a battle pack that has formed in the midfield, starting with Magnuson in 7th. Back behind him in 11th, Piastri locks up into the final chicane, and while he rejoins safely, he loses momentum and a place to Alex Albon. FIA needs to get you involved in marketing. Like, DRS train, done. We're not discussing DRS trains. We're talking about battle packs. (laughs) Hey, welcome to the battle pack. Uh, I think I picked that up from um, Australian supercars. I think that's what they use. I like it. Um, No DRS there, but... uh, Plenty of rubbing and racing. Um, yeah, so Albon takes the place, and shortly thereafter, Magnussen and Botas both have to let Ocon go by due to the uh, safety car infringement. They, um, I guess, uh, went something about a pit line. Um, but once Magnussen does so, he comes under fire from Botas and loses that place too. And with that loss of momentum, Norris then pounces on Magnussen and gets around him on the outside of turn one. Also a great move for ninth place. Uh, Lap 22, Alonso has caught up to Hamilton, who's in second, and on the back straight, gets by on the inside at the chicane and crucially has DRS on the following start-finish straight to defend. Hamilton makes some moves, but ultimately cannot get around Alonso at turn one and has to concede second place. Turn one is where all the action is. Yeah, between two former champions, no less. Uh, lap 35, more wheel-to-wheel action with Magnuson, this time with Nick DeVries for 12th place. DeVries gets a run on him and goes into the inside of turn one. Magnuson, being Magnuson, does not give an inch. <laughs> and the two sort of bang wheels and drift wide, allowing one George Russell to come through on the inside of turn two and take two places, moving himself into 12th place. We kind of forgot that like he was convinced he was done and they pulled yeah. him into the pits. You yeah. saw them do like the spot inspection of the rear end and sort of improbably give the thumbs up and off he went and he was kind of hauling ass like the uh, all the way around the track trying to regain the lost time and he'd done a pretty admirable job of it. Uh, what do we think of different because now I can't like every every time to read exactly. something and it goes 
sideways, yep. I can't help but feel like, ah, the Death Watch. The clock's hands <laughs> oh, take a, make another sweep toward midnight. And it points <laughs> towards Daniel Ricardo sitting in the wings wanting to take a... Get get a new get an well, We gotta get him again. off that grandstand. That's a good point. Maybe <laughs> maybe that's what he's doing. He's like sabotaging it. He's like, do you see how bad I am at all this other stuff? You gotta put me back in the car, Christian. Um, uh, yeah. So I yeah, this was so obviously right after this happened, they all went down to turn four. Let's call it. Um, sure. Uh, and uh, Devries basically is still battling Magnuson. Breaks. Does not make the corner, and unfortunately, also sort of blocks Magnuson from making the corner. And the two he's of them screening him off. Who and and Magnuson yeah. is trying to bail out. He's trying to say like, "All right, fine, it's your corner." Right. And then he just is gone. And now there's a car like skidding between Magnuson and yeah. the turn he needs to make. So they both go down the exit road. They both stop. Magnuson turns right away because he knows he's going to have to do like a twelve point turn to get out of here. DeVries actually reverses and almost takes out his front wing. He stops just before that. Which Ricardo was like, oh, wait, don't do that. I right. did that. <laughs> don't do it. Oh, he did. Who did Yeah. Ricard- yeah. In uh, Baku, I think. You're right. It was. Yeah, yeah. God. He did. He did that during, was that practice or quali or something? I forget. Yeah, it was down that, it, yeah. down that little exit. That's a moment right there. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It, it sure is. Yeah. Turn three Step in Baku. Step man, Sean piped up and was like yeah you reversed into Kvyat at uh, at Baku turn two yeah yeah so eventually um, um they do get out but they basically in in you know just like horrible form have to watch every other car go past before they can uh, take the the moment to do the requisite u-turn and get back on the track I said this on blue sky so nobody saw it but the, <laughs> the thing that occurred to me though is most of DeVries's worst moments like to me, I associate them with braking, like specifically that he's like not braking at the right time or he's missing a braking zone. But then I think about Yuki being on the radio, being like, these brakes don't work. These brakes, yeah. these brakes fucking suck. You're trying to kill me. You said that last <laughs> week. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. Right. And like, so there is this part of me that like, yes, it, it sort of seems like the, the verdict is in on DeVries. Like he ain't got the stuff. He is not. He is not like performing comparably to Sunoda. There's too many mistakes cropping up. All that's true, but there is this little part of me that is like, is he being sacrificed on the altar of like a car whose brakes don't work and they don't even don't work in the same way consistently? (laughs) That they are unpredictable and are prone to somewhat random failures in key moments. That would make you look like a clown in the way that DeVries has looked like a clown many times this season. And if it is actually like bad brake design, uh, I feel really bad for the turn his career has taken by being in that car. Because, like, Yuki seems to yeah. be struggling with it, too. Uh, and Yuki has a lot more F1 experience at this point. Well, Magnuson was, shall we say, magnanimous about the incident, <laughs> saying he was racing pretty hard, that's for sure, but who am I to complain about that? This wow. Quote from this Autosport, just, so. Fatherhood, man, it just changes who, people. Yeah, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, lap 40, Perez on that one-stop strategy swings by Albon, who himself is on that one-stop strategy, uh, albeit him having stopped on lap 12 while Perez stopped on lap 37. Um, Williams apparently lied to Alex Albon on how many laps were left just to keep his spirits up for how long he had to defend. Amazing. Uh, Albon says in this quote from race fans, we had to stick to the one stop when the guys told me I had, I don't know what it was, 35 or 40 laps. They even told me 20 just to make me feel better. I looked at the TV screen and I was like, oh my God, I hope that's not real. (laughs) I love that guy. Yeah. Um, race of his career. Yeah. Dude, yeah, like he, his engineer said something like, all right, now we got to do some of that classic Albon defending. And defend he did. Um, and he is aided by Russell behind him slowly, um, going slowly on lap 55. And then we get a radio message telling Russell to retire due to a left front brake wear being too high, which is a bummer because he was running in eighth place. Uh, but Alf- Albon defends um, all those cars bunching up behind him, uh, allowing Norris to do his favorite hairpin move on Botas for ninth. And lap 67, we get a troubling look from the rear of Ocon's car. Oh, boy. uh, Which (laughs) Norris calls in to say, uh, his rear wing is wobbling all over the place. It's very dangerous. Um, 
Yeah, <laughs> someone should take a look at that. Kids are watching this. Exactly. Yeah, this is not this is not okay for daytime television. Apparently, that wing does move a bit. That's what they were saying on Sky. Like it, it does have a bit of sway on it, but obviously not like that usually. But no, it was weird. But I do know that Ferrari were also trying. I think it was Ferrari were looking at, and maybe they made the switch, trying the season to get to a rear wing design that had a single anchor point to the like sort of a unit unit connection right uh to to the body which would seem to imply like they also were thinking about having a little more flux obviously it's a safe weight but as we know like good things can happen when you got kind of a weird flexy wing Mm. this one did look weird it did it did look like is it supposed to do that but it didn't (laughs) seem to be hurting him it did not look optimal although you know the, the worry here is that it will come off and you know hurt somebody right um, so race control uh, theoretically would be, would be looking at that. And I want to get your guys' read on this because this um, quote from Ottmar Safnauer, team principal of Alpine uh, in Autosport, confirmed that the team did speak to race control. Quote, we talked about it and the FIA came to us as well and said, it looks like your rear wing's moving. And we looked at it and talked about it. We were confident with a couple of laps left that it was going to be fine. Uh, we did test for that in R&D, so we put it through those tests. Uh, just because of the way it's mounted, and we therefore see those types of modes and understand if it's going to come off or not. So we're happy uh, that with all the testing that we do, that it wasn't. Yeah. What do you think about like the FIA going like, hey, uh, is that wing okay? And them going like, it's fine. And them going, okay. Hell if yeah. that was a front wing, like they're they're asking them to come in and take it off. The problem is it's a rear wing and they can't come into the pits. And I don't think they're going to allow them to do any work on it, are they? Maybe? I mean, they would, but it would totally torch the race. It would torch the race. Yeah, I guess not that much left. So I think every, that felt like one of those moments where everyone was just hoping the problem would go away, you know? I think, but here's the weird thing. Like, the FIA subjects these things to its own tests. And so, like, these are, like, they know what these wings are supposed to be able to stand up to in terms of load. The teams also have done this. And I do think you're in a weird territory of someone who's racing for position is running along behind you, and it's like that wing has bad vibes. They should be pulled in, and I should get this position. I think there is a bit of deference where the FIA cleared this thing to race, and there is not apparent damage as far as you can see that would like cause it to be in imminent risk of falling it off, falling off. The team that put it on the car, knowing the sky would fall on them if they were wrong about this, and seconds later it, it goes That's flying true. off. Yeah, uh, like they have incentives to, to be straightforward here. They are also saying it's within tolerances. I think it's probably a good no call from that standpoint. Uh, it just might look a little weird, but I'm not. I'm not actually certain that it was, you know, that extraordinary a, a behavior. Uh, well, I'll be very curious to see is if it turns out, <laughs> it turns out like running a wing that looks that perilous actually turns out to be a, like effective <laughs> by some metric. Power. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or you just or you just shaved weight somewhere. Get ready to watch a lot of like bouncy wings. Yeah. Well, uh, as Verstappen comes home to take victory by nine and a half seconds, they are still scrapping behind Albon. Norris trying desperately to make up uh, time to offset his five-second penalty, going for the outside at the chicane on Ocon, but he's got to bail out of it and finish ninth, uh, which becomes 13th after the penalty is applied. And it's that, it's that, it's the chicane, so he has to bail to the left and go around the, you know, the the entry cone, Mm. the entry area. Um, And because of that, he finishes 1.6 seconds behind Ocon. You know, not, maybe not enough to uh, have allowed him to finish in the points after the penalty, but in retrospect, maybe not the smartest move. Like, if you're trying to get time, maybe you want to stay with the guy. You know, I don't know. Yeah. Again, uh, what what is that sound, Rob? Oh, that's uh, MK coming back in. Oh, okay. I thought a Christmas elf had uh, wind chimes. Yeah. Uh, door chimes. Yeah. Door Got chimes. It. Beautiful. Um, but that's not all at the end of this race because Stroll drag races Valtteri Bottas to the line and pulls ahead at the very last moment for a photo finish to take 10th place, which does become 9th after Norris's penalty. Revenge for the time that Bottas pipped him. He did. To take second in, in I Jeddah? think, was it Baku or Jeddah? I, can't, I think it was Jeddah, was it? I'm like, I think it was, I think I remember it being Jeddah. Okay. 
the first year. Yeah, that's funny. I forgot it was both of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Photo finish. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, Alonzo um, apparently was lifting and coasting for a lot of it. He he came over the radio to kind of say that, meaning like, you know, you don't accelerate for nearly as long. You lift off the gas, but don't hit the brake into a corner to preserve your fuel because they thought they had a fuel problem. It turns out that they uh, that did not materialize in the end. Um, but uh, yeah. I feel like this is a season where I hear a lot of radio traffic from the pit wall of the drivers being like, yep, that sucks. Deal with it. <laughs> Cause like Alonzo's like, so just like, let me know when I can stop lifting and coasting. And they're like, you can't just, just <laughs> keep, just continue to suffer. And uh, Max was having some issue. I forget what it was, but he was also uncomfortable. I think on, you know, like tires or something. He also and hit a bird and like went over yeah, yeah bird guts and... uh, all over his uh, bra- brake duct. Uh, but you spitting rhymes there. <laughs> I got bird guts on my brake ducts. But like I remember him calling in and being like the car is starting to feel like pretty pretty sketchy. And the message coming back was yeah understood Max. Uh, why don't you just focus on driving it? And I was like <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> he did. Uh... Oh yeah. God. His uh, his engineer. Uh, takes no guff. Um, but Max Verstappen does win the race. Red Bull's 100th victory, and Max is 41st, equaling Eric and Senna. Uh, Fernando Alonso comes home in second, his sixth podium finish of the year, and a third former champion, Lewis Hamilton, rounding out the podium. Quite a podium. Uh, Charles Leclerc in fourth, Carlos Sainz in fifth. That good old Ferrari strategy coming in handy. Um, Sergio Perez comes home sixth, Alex Albon in seventh, holding on for a whopping six championship points, uh, big, jumping big Williams. Yes. Yeah. You're right as uh, well. Yeah. Williams up past, uh, Alfa Romeo. Yeah. Um, sorry, Alfa Romeo, Alfa Tauri. No. Yeah. But close to Alfa Romeo, right? Uh, over Alfa Tauri. Yeah. Over Alfa Tauri. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're coming up close on Alfa Romeo, are they? Yeah, so Alfa Romeo in seventh place has nine. Gene Austin and team have eight. Williams has seven. And then Alfa Tauri's got two. Um, but yes, Alex Albon in seventh. Esteban Ocon in eighth. Lance Stroll in ninth. Valtteri Bottas in tenth. Oscar Piastri finishes 11th. Followed by Pierre Gasly. Lando Norris with that five-second penalty. Uh, uh, Yuki Tsunoda in 14th. Nico Hulkenberg 15th. And Joe Guan Yu, Kevin Magnussen, Nick DeVries, and then the DNFs of George Russell and Logan Sargent. Perez, fastest lap of the race. He did eventually yeah. uh, do that second stop and get on those soft tires. Yeah, basically to, I think I think he did, he did a late stop to basically rob it from Hamilton, I remember. Yeah. Uh, all right, that's the Canadian Grand Prix. A lot to go through, and we've got a lot of news here too. So Rob, why don't you kick things off with this one about Red Bull? Yeah, this was uh, just in some remarks that came before the race. Uh, Christian Horner was talking about his concern that there is a race to the bottom with salaries under the F1 cost cap. And he was sort of explaining basically why there are a lot of senior staff at teams being made redundant because, remember, only those top three salaries are exempt from the cost cap after that. Anyone on payroll is being deducted from the total spend you are permitted uh, each each year, and he, you know, he said you ha- you have to make sure it's not a race to the bottom. The problem is you have longstanding personnel that have contributed a significant amount that you don't just want to see forced out of their roles because of the cap, just because you can justify ten youngsters versus an experienced hand, and that's the constant debate that you have, and where we've just had redundancies redundancies through the cap. Jane Poole. Uh, the gloss here from Autospar was uh, she was the former uh, Red Bull COO and HR director. Uh, Horner continues was one of those as well. She was a redundancy that we made because we couldn't justify a role within the cap. And I do think like I'm increasingly turning against the cap, like for the reasons it turns out that salary caps end up being kind of a market distorting force in any sport. It's the same issue is cropping up where like I was on board with it from the standpoint of this thing was passed under COVID where a lot of teams appeared to be, it's like, you know, we're on our last legs. We don't know what the future holds for this thing. And what the future held was a massive explosion in value. Uh, and two, <laughs> you know, I did 
sort of buy into this notion of, yeah, like people should not be able to just be able to spend their way to victory. I do want some parity here, but it seems to have had a couple effects. One is to really arrest the amount of development we see during the course of a season, despite the fact the season is endless, uh, which is not generating compelling uh, championship battles. But then the other part of this is, they are we we talk about this every year about both the wear and tear on like team members just keeping the schedule, but then also the fact that with pay effectively suppressed by a cost cap, you've you've precluded a lot of like basic career development stuff. Like you know you're going to stay here, you're going to rise to the ranks, you're going to get like raises. Like the opposite is happening. And at a certain point, that is, that's got to be a cause for concern. Um, you know, it seems, know, it seems like a really shitty situation. Yeah, I, I guess I don't feel super bad for, like, people who are, like, head of HR at this big company. Like, she'll find work somewhere else. Other people will find some work somewhere else. Like, if Red Bull can't afford to employ the best of the best and those people go to other companies, then, like, is that not? good <laughs> that they but don't the teams can't but the other the companies whole... can't afford them either because they're working under the same cost cap and like imagine it's not an hr supervisor imagine it's like a senior mechanic right like somebody who's like good R like if it's red bull who have so you're saying like you think the same thing is the case at williams yeah because it's happening williams aren't the spending the same amount it's of not like it's not like but... red bull can't spend it and ah now it's being kept more equal across the sport that mechanic can't be like I need to be paid more for the work I'm doing. Oh, the market is distorted up and down the grid. Nobody will pay me for this work because unless I fall into the Adrian Newey bucket, I like just nobody is paying this amount for F1 mechanics. Uh, so that's that's kind of my concern is that there's gonna be a lot of roles up and down teams that you can't like that don't grow with you with your life and you can't like grow out of. It just becomes re a, a revolving door of what is the cheapest labor we can afford for this. I I can just imagine a scenario where Williams are probably not paying as much as Red Bull anyway because they're not as prestigious a place and because they can't afford to. Um, and Red Bull are not only paying more, but they have twice as many personnel because there is no cost cap and they can basically spend as much as they want. And like to me, that is what a big part of the problem is in lots of sports where they can spend lots of money. People focus a lot on, like this happens in soccer. Like it's happening with Newcastle at the moment where it just got bought over by the Saudi uh, public fund um, and they're already having doing great in the Premier League even though they haven't bought a bunch of players. But what is happening is that they're able to retain a lot of the backroom staff that they have. They're able to put lots of money into infrastructure at the uh, stadium, at the training grounds. You're able to hire more people to do that sort of stuff. Like, hire better people and like that stuff does have an effect on the team like you can't see it it's like an invisible power you get to do when you're a large corporation so honestly i think like i hear what you're saying that like i it could i can see how like in a less extreme example of putting williams against red bull for instance there it maybe it's cutting off everyone at, at the knees um but uh, yeah, there's part of me that's a little bit less sympathetic to the bigger teams in that respect because they've this has probably been something where they've been able to spend more than everyone for a long time, and it probably has benefited them, you know. Yeah, and and this is the this is you know the growing pains, the getting used to this this era. Yeah, like um, I I hear that to a point, but to me, it also like the cost cap when you really look at it we're kind of doing this on the cheap. If you consider like, you know, like the, the salaries and card of Elmer are coming out of the same bucket and what, it, like what teams are allowed to spend on it. It does kind of feel like there is some, there are a lot of ingredients for wage suppression here. That I right. see. Yeah. Yeah. That that's, that's, that's the other side of the coin. And I can see, I can definitely see that. Yeah. But I, I guess if you could get like, you know how they, they, uh, they prorate your um, wind tunnel time by, okay. Finish in the championship. What if you did that with, uh, you know, personnel salaries? That could be interesting. I mean, I don't know. Like to me, this is like this is how you get unions to an extent. Is at a certain <laughs> point, if, <laughs> if the mechanics are getting it in the teeth. If that's like, the case, though, but what 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 Horner said was that it's harder to hold on to the one 
a veteran than it is to employ 10 younger people. So I don't know if it's the bottom of the totem pole that's getting screwed here so much. Or maybe it is. Maybe they're just getting... Maybe entry level at these companies is so terrible that that's what... That's it certainly seems happened. like it's terrible. Like, how many how many companies have good entry levels? Like, yeah, in this fair. day and yeah. age. Like, <laughs> like a lot of times the promise is you start in the mailroom, you get your foot in the door, you pay your dues, you got a career. And now it's kind of like, oh, nice start of a career you've got there. Shame we have to let you go because now we don't have money to pay for that next step. And also okay. we can now replace yeah. you with two younger sets of backs and like knees and such. You can, you can handle wear and tear. So I don't yeah. know. It's, okay. I think I'm, it I'm is... starting to come around to your line of thinking on that actually. Yeah. And I there is also a little bit of like, if you can't afford to compete in the sport, sell the team, find someone who can't like, Oh, do you, do you, does it suck getting the like the doors blown off your car every every weekend? <laughs> I am sure somebody is out there. Uh, Michael Andretti will take that team off your hands. <laughs> he's, he's, right, he's right here. I have him. Uh, he, he will. He will take he's that. He's on this uh, phone here. Yeah. here. yeah, He's got. He's got a trailer right out, right outside. Uh, anyway, <laughs> speaking of teams that maybe should have been sold. I thought this was just really interesting. Uh, James this one was, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess that's true. But like, I guess the point is maybe sold a long time before it eventually was. Because mm. James Valls was he's he's been on sort of this media tour, and okay, it's also very, it's self serving up to a point because it is a media tour about how he's here to save the day. He is cleaning house at Williams. You would not believe the mess he inherited, but it does also <laughs> kind of seem like. This is somebody who came from straight from Mercedes into Williams. And you know how in the Williams documentary had this vibe of like, wow, they are so insular. This is kind of a weird little family business. And it's like James Wiles steps into this thing and in tr like while trying to be nice, increasingly sounds like things were a real mess. And he was talking about when he got there, uh, some of Williams uh, technology was 20 years out of date. And wow. Whoa. Yeah, he was describing uh, like the fact that there are like fabrication processes and materials that they use that were like cutting edge ages ago back in the Williams like Team Glory uh, days. They're kind of still in play at this team and are used doing, nowhere else. They're doing CFD on gateway computers. <laughs> it see like it sort of seems like they have the early adopter problems. If you think about Williams, had this reputation as being a really cutting edge team for a long time, they would find these competitive advantages through, through tech, but they weren't a rich family in that way. They weren't like endless amounts of capital rich. And so it kind of seems like they're a family business who adopted early to some like technological changes and then were wedded to it forever. So he's mm. talking about like, yeah, the, a lot of their equipment, their, their processes were, were ages out of date. They're using materials that were, not as strong and, and too heavy as they should be. But, and this was the thing that really caught my eye. He also said the staff had gotten a little weird. Quote, if you take Excuse a group me? of people and hide them away and take another group of people and hide them away, they evolve to different stages. And that's what <laughs> happened. The view of what excellence <laughs> is, is completely different to what it really is today. You have to move things forward. Internally, a lot of the work I've been asking them to do has been likened to asking us to do three years in development in six months. Uh, yes, but that's the standard. In fact, the standard is higher uh, than that. And he just goes on sort of describing the fact that he's having to basically, like, bring this team to Jesus in some ways as far as, like, what, what are current standards. But it's a little bit, like, under the bus, team, here you go. But also at the same time, I could kind of believe it. Again, if it's a family business where there's lifers and they, they're they stuck on old tech and they don't rotate out much, I could sort of see it being like, it's it's like Portlandia, but for ancient F1 like <laughs> right. standards and yeah. practices, where it's like I, the I, 90s never ended. I, I, it sounds like... It's like, it's like, what is it? Like Homo erectus and Neanderthal or something. He's talking about it. I'm just, now I feel bad that 
did Paddy Lowe like go into like the aer- aerodynamics wing of Williams and it was just full of Neanderthals or something who didn't who were like locked away forever and didn't know how to make modern cars. Um it's it's striking language. Like it, it seems like you could and other people have probably used much more vague language to try and explain the sort of I don't know evolutionary rot that seems to be in in that team um i wonder what he's doing to solve us like do you just have to get everyone out of there and get a whole new team in like or get leadership out or what happens because it sounds like it's a you know it's deep some of these comments he's given sound like it's about attracting business and like reassuring possible investors that like things are on the the turnaround but some of it also has the subtext of hey it's put up or shut up time like i've been nice so far i'm not going to be nice for much longer it kind of sounds like there's some pushback well speaking of being nice danny are we already talking about the silly season we are but thankfully this one is more of a sort of a hey we're gonna take this silly season off uh this uh coming from autosport.com uh gunter steiner saying that uh, Haas is expected to retain its current F1 drivers for 2024. Uh, this uh, quote from Steiner, driver market wise, I think we're in uh, the moment we, sorry, I think we are in the moment. We are pretty happy with what we've got. Obviously we want to get uh, to announce our drivers as soon as possible. So we don't have to hang around like last year, a long time telling you guys it'll be the next race and then it gets boring. So perhaps unsurprisingly, I think it's a tale of two drivers over there a little bit. Uh, kind of seems like Hulkenberg is absolutely loving his uh, his his uh, rebirth in F1, and Magnussen, the family man who seems to not really mind when people uh, drive him off the the track, uh, is underperforming perhaps based on last year. Or what do we well, think? The weird thing is, like I would agree because it does seem like Hulkenberg has the best of him in qualifying, but it also doesn't matter because their race pace is so bad. They're finishing yeah, pretty true. close together. So mm-hmm. I think if you're Magnuson, you can kind of say, like, yeah, Hulkenberg's getting a lot of meaningless wins on Saturday, but in the end, we we arrive at the same point. And so I could see him being chill about it. And, hey, way fewer busted-up cars than at any point That's in true. history. That's true. And also, hey, look, as meaningless as it was, and ultimately it wasn't even the case, I think that was a huge boon to Haas to have that uh, to have him on, uh, on the podium or, or second uh, for qualifying. You know, that'll that'll make a lot of people happy. Well, speaking of drivers uh, becoming commentators, Danny, or uh, Rob, rather, uh, let's talk Jensen Button. Yeah, Button is ready to trade in his boat shoes for a pair of racing booties once again. <laughs> uh, flashback three months ago, he came away from driving a NASCAR at Coda saying it was basically a miserable experience. It was hell. It was torment to drive. <laughs> uh, cut to two weeks after Le Mans, after he drove the Garage 56 car at, at Le Mans. And... I didn't think I'd want to do a full se- full season again because of how busy the schedule always is, but I feel I'll be racing in something next year doing the full season. It's great doing one-off races, but you don't get the uh, but you don't get the best out of yourself, and that's why doing three races here in Cup is really good because I want to get to spend more time with the team and the simulator, and really get to work with my engineer, my crew chief, develop the skills between us, and to develop an understanding. So yes, I want to do a full season next year time permitting i need to balance a few things i've been very busy this year it will be endurance racing which means it will be either imsa or wec and so he's gotten bit by that endurance racing bug mm-hmm. and he he got a taste i mean he's over that, 40 he, that's what happened he got a taste right? of that v8 american muscle <laughs> and he's like i want to drive a corvette <laughs> good for him uh, amazing i yeah. i yeah best best of luck jensen Love to see you in uh, living your best racing life. Um, well, kind of a sour note here. Um, speaking of different racing series, W Series has gone into administration. Mm. Uh, in American, that means they are bankrupt um, and uh, does not look like they have laid everyone off and they're looking to find a buyer. I don't know what you were selling at that point. Um, but it looks like W series is pretty much no more. Uh, the only silver lining here. And if you're unfamiliar, W series was the, uh, women only racing series that was trying to, you know, vault female drivers into the formula system. 
The only really silver lining here is that uh, we have now F1 Academy, which is doing um, roughly the same thing, albeit with, you know, it's much less watchable. I don't think yeah. they yet live stream it anywhere. They do have um, uh, kind of recap videos of about 15 minutes uh, per round uh, on F1's YouTube channel. Um, but yeah, I, I I think it was a really interesting uh, and worthwhile experiment, and uh, it's a shame to to see it uh, its demise. I yeah, it was. What do you guys uh, think? We we it was fun. I think we covered it a lot. We covered it early, and we covered it a bunch. And there was a couple of issues with it. I think one you had a fairly top heavy person um, um, skill. Uh, I don't know how to finish the sentence. Jamie Chadwick, Jamie Chadwick was too good. won all the championships. Yeah, she won all the championships. She was super dominant. There were some other great drivers in there for sure, and um, battling for those uh, those other podium spots. But you did that. That was sort of like. You know, in the same way Max Verstappen right now is super dominant in a really good car. Um, I guess the issue with it being more of a stock series and W series um made it feel all the more um frustrating, maybe. Um so there was that of course. Uh but yeah, I think, you know, it, it's it's it just goes to show that like doing any of the any of these race series it there's so many um top forms of racing that just cannot keep themselves financially stable in the long run like it's expensive to, to a certain extent all of this is ridiculous the fact that yeah. any of this is is a sport that gets funded it doesn't it, it never felt none of these ever feel like sports that fund themselves in any way they feel like you know the sort of uh toy boy money from large corporations it's a marketing exercise it's it's historic and all those types of things um so it's always very difficult for uh, what is essentially a startup series to try and go global right away. Um, hey, look, I think it started a lot of uncomfortable conversations that a lot of people probably didn't want to have for a long time. And I think that was good. Uh, Chadwick is now in Indy Next, right? I think. Yep. So um, at least one driver's done well out of it. If that's the only legacy, I think that is a shame. Um, hopefully some of the other drivers are in the F1 Academy stuff. Um yeah, so uh, racer.com has a, a good roundup here. Um, they mentioned Jamie Chadwick in Indy Next, which is like Formula 2, but for IndyCar. Um, the series also helped the likes of Alice Powell return to racing and kept Abby pulling in single suitors before securing a full Alpine Academy position for 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, and a few of them are now in F1 Academy. Yeah, but it just, it, it, if, if anything, maybe the final sort of um, uh, expression of W Series is the fact that it did go into administration just does sort of confirm how difficult it is for uh, women to break into F1 um, whole cloth. Uh, hopefully the Academy stuff, I really think they need to get eyes on that. I don't know why they're not getting eyes on that, especially considering how, I don't know, like they feel way more uh, forward about pushing F2 and F3 than they did five or ten years ago, definitely. Um, so yeah, hopefully it gets a bit more eyeballs over there uh because that's a big part of the thing as as we all know getting the drivers faces out there can completely change your market and that's what's happened with f1 with drive to survive we got the helmets off that's the big thing and like exposing these people and and finding out their stories and everything so um hopefully they can do that with f1 academy and fair play to everyone who was involved in w series and tried to make it happen uh, well, Zenny, um, finally here, uh, a, a, on a lighter note. Yeah, uh, speaking of, I guess, uh, l little F little racing series that could. Um, so uh, we went to the NASCAR race in uh, Sonoma, Motors or Sonoma Raceway. I keep calling it Motors, Sonoma Raceway. Um, uh, was it last two weeks ago now, I think it was? Um, yeah. A lot of fun. And then... Uh, I moved up to Petaluma here in Sonoma County, and I knew that there was a track here. So it was Father's Day on Sunday. So I asked my wife, uh, I was like, I'm just going to go to this track. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to drink some beers. I'm going to see what it's like. Alone? And alone. Oh, now that is a Father's Day gift. Yeah. And oh, my God, I had the most fun. It was <laughs> absolutely fantastic. What was playing? So it was a, it's a dirt oval. So it's an oval dirt. It's really tight. I, it's like, I think some of the guys said it's like the smallest dirt oval in like 
California or something. Okay. It's like it's, an eighth it, of a mile or something. Oh yeah, like I don't. They do laps in like you know thirty seconds or something. It's like ridiculous. Um, so they had. I don't know all of the names of the uh, of the um, things, but they had they had sprint cars. Okay, uh, those are the but, ones with the huge wings on top. So they had wingless sprint cars. Okay, so they had they are basically the same, but they don't have the big buckets on the front. Got it. And um, they still have big wings on the back. And they're almost going sideways the entire time on this Got oval. Um, so that was amazing. They had dwarf cars, which are like, just as you can imagine, like super little, little small ones. And then they had, I forget what the regular ass looking ones. Well, regular in comparison to the two of them were called. Um, they had a couple of series of them, but they had qualifying. There was uh, um, heat races. And then the final races were like maybe eight or 10 cars like maybe 15 laps or so. I'll be honest, the problem here was that I went at like 4 o'clock and I thought there was only going to be like 2 hours of racing or something. It was like 4 and a half hours of racing <laughs> and all they had was Coors Light or Lagunitas IPA and I started on the Lagunitas and 5 hours later <laughs> Danny was like, I made a bunch of friends around me. I was like chatting to all these other race dads who were hanging out um, and then when the races ended Everyone was walking like towards pit road, I guess, just around the back. It's all amateur drivers. You know what I mean? Like they're all, you know, one of the guys was a teacher and a bunch of the kids parents were there cheering them on. Amazing. Oh man. It was just like the most awesome. I'm definitely going back. Like I just had so much fun, but I went to the pits and um, was just walking around, went up to a bunch of cars and one of the drivers came out and was like, Hey, you want to step in it? And so I got into one of the cars. (laughs) It was like, it was like, I bared my like, my big ass barely fit in the thing and it was like watching the shifter they like barely get to second gear on on some of these things um yeah they were just like held together and you could barely like blind spots were crazy and yeah it was cool there was a couple of uh crashes there was a lot of great overtaking um i had an absolute blast and i tweeted a picture of it and i was just completely inundated with replies of people saying like yes support your local speedway and all this stuff i yeah. they don't have this stuff where, where i grew up in ireland we used to have i used to go to drift tournaments and stuff like that but like not this this is just like this is right in the middle of town uh oval you know it was just a blast and uh, yeah the only thing uh, next time i will i will drink the core is light i think because father's day was was <laughs> was rough let me say that i couldn't hear much and oh. uh, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't eat much either. Yeah, but an absolute blast. Absolutely loved it. Would love to go back. Maybe I'll do a little, um, little uh, shift F one Petaluma meetup or something. Maybe there's some listeners around here uh, who would like to go. That'd be that'd be a lot of fun. Man, that sounds great. Yeah, it's a good time. Uh, well, if you would like to join the race standings yourself, you can join our fantasy team using the link in the show notes. The top three, the podium from uh, Canada in our fantasy league are in third place Verstappen underscore go. Uh, and then a tie for first between Whoa. fast, but not too fast. The number two <laughs> Ooh. and hug me Gunther. Wow. Are they, is that a, <laughs> that's a, that's an interesting pairing. Uh, well, they, they might share something with, uh, one of the podium sitters on, uh, uh, the overall standings here. Number three, Oberhof racing number two, totohornerfanfic.com whoa <laughs> mm-hmm. and in first place <laughs> understeer underscore mcbride you know ai gets a lot of flack but i bet you could make an interesting fanfic there's a lot of video of those guys out there you know what i mean it's true oh my god <laughs> ai video of that oh yeah uh it sounds horrifying shift up um, one only fans sign up now <laughs> shift to home podcast at gmail.com if you want to send us <laughs> that email uh f1.cool slash emails also will uh go right to our inbox uh you can also find us on the socials using the links in the show notes that's us around the internet should we take it around the world of racing danny let's race around the world <laughs> yeah as mentioned f1 academy is racing this weekend uh at circuit zandvoort they have three races on thursday friday and saturday Uh, The World Rally Championship is in Kenya for the Safari Rally Kenya. Kenya Rally around the Safari? Sorry. Sorry. I'm a dad. That's true. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll, I'll let it go this time. Uh, We got them Craftsman Trucks at the Nashville Super Speedway for the 
Rackley Roofing 200. I'm slowly becoming <laughs> a NASCAR fan, I think. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we've got uh, MotoGP uh, is at TT Circuit Assen this weekend for the Ooh. sprint and uh, the race. Formula E is at the Portland International Raceway in Portland, Oregon for the Portland E Prix. Speaking of Portlandia. Why are they at a raceway? Weren't they supposed to be racing in city streets? Get it together, Formula E. We also have DTM. Oh, is it an Assen? <laughs> <laughs> Close. It's in the Circuit Zandvoort as well. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, the NASCAR Xfinity Series <clears throat> is also at the Nashville Super Speedway for the Tennessee Lottery 250. Woo. Um, Moto Cross Grand Prix. He's unsure. Is what is this place? <laughs> Whoa! It is the circuit spelled S I R K U I T. Moto Cross Internacional Samota in Indonesia. Wow. wow. Okay. Okay. Uh, the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. Is at Watkins Glen International for Salem's six hours of the Glen. Mm. And we got NASCAR. Where are we at? We're in Nashville. Also right? at the Nashville Super Speedway for the Ally 400. Only allies. Yep. Lebanon, Tennessee. Lebanon, Tennessee. Indeed. My uncle was stationed there. UN Peacekeeper. Wow. <laughs> a, lot, a lot going on in Tennessee. <laughs> um, that's what's going on this weekend. What's going on on this day, Danny? Oh, on this day, June 21st. Well, the fans at Jarama Circuit in Spain, maybe that's Harama, uh, were in for a treat today in 1981 when they were able to enjoy one of the closest Grand Prix finishes ever. Ferrari's Gilles Villeneuve surged up through the order from 7th to lead by lap 14 with a trail of cars running closely behind him led by Jacques v oh sorry Jacques I was about to say Jacques Villeneuve that would have been weird his son uh, Jacques Lafitte <laughs> Villeneuve was faster on the straights but he was having to work hard to fight off challengers in the corners for the last 18 laps the leading five cars were nose to tail Villeneuve managed to hold them all off to win with the first five cars all crossing the line within 1.24 seconds the second closest race in the history of the sport at the time. Uh, like any good Brazilian, Ayrton Senna was passionate about football. That's soccer to you guys. Uh, mm. On this day in 1986, he qualified on pole for the Detroit GP and immediately left the circuit so he could watch Brazil take on France in the World Cup quarterfinals, leaving a tape of his comments about the lap for the press. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Just Duck sitting on the... The chair is just a VHS. Yeah, just ducking off work, but uh, kind and considerate when it comes to his friends in the media. Uh, Brazil lost on penalties, but Senna won the race the next day. Great. Good stuff. They would later go on to beat France in the World Cup in 19... Am I crazy? 98? No. Mm, yeah, wish I hadn't started that sentence, because then I'm not sure. <laughs> Do you think it'd be Betamax back then for your, your it was broadcast probably a, tapes? It was probably just an audio tape. Oh, you're right. You're right. Uh, well, if you would like to send us your Betamax tapes, you could do so somehow. Because um, you send them to Danny. Do he's, I've, he's I've, got, been, I've been I've been doing a lot of recording Betamax <laughs> tapes actually the past couple of weeks. So, uh, and if you'd like to support the show and get access to all of our bonus episodes and the official Shift F1 Discord, you can do so at Patreon.com/ShiftF1. We'll be back next week for the pre-Austria episode uh, until then have a good race weekend everyone we will see you all next week france actually bet brazil 3-0 in the 1980 world cup Meow.